Hi, friend. It's Deanna Willison from Our Blooming Catholic Life. And you know, I've been really looking at the Beatitudes an awful lot lately. And one of the things, ooh, getting a little chilly here. Good thing I have that prayer sweater laying around. Um, one of the things that really has stood out or that was recommended to, to me was Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Jesus of Nazareth has a treatment on on the Beatitudes. So this is sort of a book review, but we're going to try and when we do our reading the passage inside, I have marked the passage on the Beatitudes as well. I have the study guide in case you've tried to read the main book and it was a little challenging for you. Ignatius also has a study guide so we can peek inside that as well. I already have my bookmark in. So let's go in. Benedict said, this book is my personal search for the face of the Lord. I know reviews on him got really popular right after he passed. And so I was letting, letting a hot minute pass before I brought this to you. This Jesus of Nazareth, this particular edition is from the baptism in the Jordan to the transfiguration. There's another volume later. Um, this is by Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, translated from the German by Adrian J. Walker, and is published by, again, Ignatius Press of San Francisco. So it's nice the study guide is done by the same company. They aren't always, but that's good to know. Let's see here. The copyright was 2007. Even the German, it was simultaneously published in Germany. Wow. I didn't know that. Um, same copyright edition or date as well. Let's see here. Scriptural quotations, except for the author's original translations, what? <laughs> are from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, Bible copyrighted 1952, second edition 1971, by Division of Christian Education of the National Councils of Churches. I'm curious as to whether or not that does look like it is the second edition. Okay, good to know. Uh, there's also excerpts from A Rabbi Talks with Jesus by Jacob Neusner, and that was copyrighted 2000, and it is used with permission. There are, oh, look at the table of contents. Not happy with that. Um, you're going to know why. I literally just did a book review with these same, a lot of these same things. It is several pages. Um, but I don't know why they do this. There's abbreviations, a publisher's note, and a foreword introduction. Then quite a number of chapters. Let's see here. Ten, ten chapters. Then there's a glossary. Ooh, a glossary. Bibliography and an index. So surprisingly, they did a study edition as well when there's a glossary and all that in here. Um, so what did I like about the table of contents? The, like, look how far over it is to the numbers in some cases. And again, the chapters, they should have used a numeral. There's so much text here. Excuse me. Hey, sneeze. Um, numerals would have been helpful there. And instead of bolding some things and then having the smaller categories not bolded, they instead made it into a super tiny, tiny font. Chapter one. Oh, wait, introduction is an initial reflection on the mystery of Jesus. Chapter one, the baptism of Jesus. Chapter two, the temptations of Jesus. Chapter three, the gospel, the kingdom of God. Chapter four is the Sermon on the Mount, which is broken down into the Beatitudes, the Torah of the Messiah. And then it has, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, that's on the same page numbers, the dispute the concerning the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, the family, the people, and the community of Jesus's disciples, compromise and prophetic radicalism. That's all in chapter four. Chapter five is the Lord's prayer. And there are a number of subsections there as well. I think he goes, yes, each of the, each of the petitions is addressed separately. It's interesting that they're separated so much. They do come one after the other in Matthew. Remember, we've talked about that is a huge important point in understanding the Lord's prayer is understanding the Beatitudes. They go together. Chapter six is then the disciples. Chapter seven is the message of the parables. And again, not only are there subheadings, there's sub subheadings. They're get and they just make it tinier each time. Goodness. Chapter eight is the principal images of John's gospel. Chapter nine, two milestones on Jesus's way, which are Peter's confession in the transfiguration. Chapter 10 is Jesus declares his identity as the son of man, the son, and I am. 
again, then there's a glossary, a bibliography, and an index. So right after that are, just curious about, just going to check something here quick. Oh, these are, oh, that's really interesting. Okay, the abbreviations used for the book. So they're kind of broken up on two pages. I don't know what these giant spaces are for. I feel like if they got rid of all these giant headers, maybe it would have all fit on one page. But so there's an abbreviation and then there's what it is. They have Old and New Testament mixed in together, which people don't normally do. Um, and then like First Chronicles and Second Chronicles are done alphabetically, even though there is a number there. The numbered ones aren't separated. That is a stylistic choice there as well. Oh, and their columns. Okay. This also appears to be using, um, the we'll just say the most modern terms. I can't even think. These may be the Hebrew terms. So it's these two are to go together, then these two, then these two, then these two. Okay. A little confusing. And then it tells you, oh, wait, there's some other abbreviations like A. T D are the Das Alte Testament Deutsch. And it explains what that is. It's a famous commentary. C S E L Corpus Scriptum Ecclesiasticorum Lumptinorum. Oh my goodness. So there are some other documents there as well. Their abbreviations are there. And then it tells you that it's the RSV is the preferred translation, but it's not the one always used occasionally. Remember the author actually translates directly from the original biblical text. That's such an odd thing to say because we know there are different versions of the Bible. There, you know, the Greek one and there's then what there's one that they call by a mysterious letter that we don't even know if it exists. I don't know. Original but biblical text is not is there an original biblical text? Just saying. I don't I don't know what that means. I would have liked them to say outright what they translated it from. And maybe that's going to come up when we run into that. Um, I'm just going to jump in here. Let's give a look at some of those features in the back. The glossary. Again, this print is way more, way smaller than it needs to be. And it was prepared by Doubleday. I don't know why that different publisher has going to have prepared the glossary. Was it? Ignatius can't do that. I, I don't understand. Maybe they were the original German publisher. So the words are like apocalypse, noun, genre, focused on the eschatology and or visions of heavenly mysteries. See eschatology, adjective, apocalyptic, apocryphal. Adjective designates writings not included in the church's canon of holy scripture. So it goes on. Um, there are cross references. It is interesting that it gives you noun and adjectives. The bibliography, I'm just curious how long it is. Uh, it's as a hefty bibliography. And then there is an index to help you find things. And the index is quite hefty as well. So let's just look here. Um, okay. The Beatitudes. Dun, dun, dun. I'm a little bit in apparently. Oh, because it starts out with the Sermon on the Mount. So there's some more general things from the Sermon on the Mount before it comes in. I'm on chapter four, which is page 64 in this edition. Again, what's with those giant waste of space? And then we have tiny print. I don't understand the giant margins and then the tiny print. Matthew immediately follows the story of Jesus's temptation with a short account of the beginning of his ministry. In this context, he explicitly presents Galilee as Galilee of the Gentiles as the place where the prophets, Isaiah 8, 23 and 9, 1, had foretold that a great light, referencing Matthew 4, 15. I almost wish these biblical references would be on as a footnote because it's, it's kind of hard to read. Would dawn. In this way, Matthew responds to the surprise that the Savior does not come from Jerusalem and Judea, but from a district that was actually regarded as half pagan. The very thing that in the eyes of many tells against Jesus' messianic mission, the fact that he comes from Nazareth, from Galilee, is in reality the proof of his divine mission. From the start of his gospel, Matthew claims the Old Testament for Jesus, even when it comes to apparent minutiae. What Luke's 
states as a fundamental principle without going into detail in his account of the journey to Emmaus, CF Luke 24, 25 FF, namely that all the scriptures refer to Jesus, Matthew, for his part, tries to demonstrate to all the details of Jesus's past. Interesting. So, so far you can see this is fairly accessible. The language is totally accessible. Um, let's look a little bit. I'm going to jump to page 74. Um, halfway through the first paragraph, the Beatitudes are the transposition of the cross and the resurrection into discipleship, but they apply to the disciple because they were first paradigmatically lived by Christ himself. Anyone else wonder if paradigmatically is in the glossary in the back? I'm betting it's not, but I would really like to see if it is. It is not. <laughs> that's crazy. Like, why is that word not in there? You can't use a word that's that long and not put it in the glossary. This becomes even more evident if we turn now to consider Matthew's version of the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 3 through 12. Anyone who reads Matthew's text attentively will realize that the Beatitudes present a sort of veiled interior bibliography of Jesus, a kind of portrait of his figure. He who has no place to lay his head, Matthew 8.20, is truly poor. He who can say, come to me for I am meek and lowly in heart, is truly meek. He's, I'm going to skip the scripture references just for the sake of reading this, but trust me, they're here. He is the one who is pure of heart and so unceasingly beholds God. He is the peacemaker. He is the one who suffers for God's sakes. The Beatitudes display the mystery of Christ himself, and they call us into communion with him. But precisely because of their hidden Christological character, the Beatitudes are also a roadmap for the church, which recognizes in them the model of what she herself should be. They are directions for discipleship, directions that concern every individual, even though, according to the variety of calling, they do so differently for each person. Let us now take a somewhat closer look at each individual link in the chain of the Beatitudes. I am going to stop there. There are hyphenated words here. The scripture references are kind of awkward because they really interrupt the flow of thought for me. Like, I love that they're there, and I also don't like that they're there. They're they're really disturbing my flow of thought, but maybe not for other people. I'm going to stop there and say that, wow, if you haven't read this, right? Great book for Lent. The Beatitudes are showing you Christ. They're revealing Christ to you, but also they're showing you a way of discipleship. Are you living out your Lent as Christ? Let's see here. Let's look at this study guide again. This is also Ignatius. The Introduction was done by Mark Brumley, MTS. Outlines by Matthew Levering, PhD. The summaries, terms, and questions were by Thomas Harmon, MA, and Laura Dittus, MA. When was it this copyrighted? 2008. So this came out a couple years after. And this is using, this is using the RSB CE2 and the Revised Standard Version. <laughs> The Apocrypha. So there is a number of different translations of scripture listed. Introduction to the study guide. Now, although this one did not use numerals, the way they number out the chapter, see how it's a different font, still makes it easier to see. Um, and there's a new glossary in here. There's a glossary in the back of here. Oh, this glossary is totally different, but I'm totally geeking out on it. Um, Look at this like Jesus poem, and it tells you the page number where it's at. It doesn't tell you whether it's noun or adjective. Who needs that? Term used by Pope Benedict, adopted from Martin Hengel, to contrast with the pneumatic gospel. A Jesus poem is a fanciful creation of the author reflecting his own impression of Jesus and subject to the author's own foibles and faulty memory rather than being rooted in communion with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. What? Is that pneumatic gospel word in here too? See if that's in here. It is page 235, theological term affirming the historicity of a gospel based on the communion of the author with Jesus, the subject of the gospel through the Holy Spirit. This term points to the ability of the gospel to lead the reader past the externals into a deep interiority of the words and events that it narrates. There's there's people. People are in the glossary. Okay, Pontius Pilate, well, that's not who I meant, like um, a German biblical scholar. He's in here too, in the glossary. 
That is awesome. Okay, I love this glossary. Um, let's see here. What else? Introduction to the study guide. This booklet aims to help the average reader who approaches Jesus of Nazareth without the benefit of extensive, extensive theological or biblical training to get as much out of the work as possible. The goal is not to replace the book, but to make it more accessible and more fruitful. To that end, this introduction is divided into two parts. The first part surveys some key ideas important to understanding Jesus of Nazareth. The second explains how to use the various features of this booklet for individual or group study. <laughs> the fact that the Jesus of Nazareth is an important book does not make it an easy read for everyone. Although it's not a scholarly treatise, it is also not a popular life of Christ. Instead, it is a book that addresses the average informed reader in light of modern scholarly discussions about Jesus in the Bible. To understand Jesus of Nazareth, it helps if readers know a bit about some of the important controversies in biblical studies in the last hundred years. And it talks first about Christianity is a historical religion, the historical critical method and biblical criticism, the Jesus of history, and the Christ of faith, not a work of the magisterium, and how to use the study guide. How to use the study guide, it says it's the second part of it, but it's it's just this tiny little bit. You have like five pages of background in this tiny little bit, so don't, don't freak out about that. Each of the 12 sections of Jesus of Nazareth, forward introduction in 10 chapters, there's a corresponding section that has, one, a summary of the section or chapter, two, an outline, three, a list of important terms, four, study or discussion questions, and five, an area for readers to include their personal reflections on the reading. Also included in this study guide is a glossary of terms, which we loved. The resources of this booklet can be used for individual study and reflection or group study and discussion. Group study can easily be divided into 12 sessions corresponding to the 12 sections of Jesus of Nazareth. Really? I would so, so not make it 12 sessions. Are you really going to get through a chapter of this a week? Maybe a month. Maybe you could do one a month. Well, then you, it would take you a year and that, that would be decent. Yeah. Um, the following structure is recommended if you're using it in a group session. An opening prayer. Read the summary aloud. Discuss the summary. Then do review of the questions for discussion or discussion of a particular passage of the te text. Comments on personal reflection and closing prayer. Large numbers often pose problems for group discussions. Those interested in using this book with study groups may want to limit the size between 3 to 20 people. In parish settings, it might be helpful to create more than one study group. Honestly, you could divide into small tables or something. There's no reason you couldn't do that, I, I don't think. We hope that through this study guide and through the work of Benedict XVI that you may be led to an encounter Christ more deeply and evermore to seek his face, referencing Psalms 27.8, and that's by Mark Brumley. So what does that look like? Even the foreword has a summary. There's literally an outline. Um, it's literally your traditional outline method, uh, which is interesting. Some people now prefer like a mind map or something, but that's hard to put in a book. But if you're someone that needs that, perhaps someone in your group could make you. You could probably make a poster board that has using the outline that has a nice mind map for people. Um, it'd be really cool if, sorry, if there was like a digital edition of this on the web and it had mind maps or alternate forms of outlines. I, just a lot of people don't think this way. People with reading or learning disabilities, the mind mapping system can be better. Questions for understanding. Um, like here's number, this one has six. What would be the significance of a cleft between the historical Jesus and the Christ of faith in light of Benedict's statement that Jesus Christ brings God to men. Two, were the limits of the historical critical method that Benedict seeks to overcome in Jesus of Nazareth? What does he say is the source of the limitations? This one gives you a page reference even. Uh, oh, most of these give you a page reference, but the first one didn't. Three, despite the historical critical method's limitations, why does Benedict regard it as indispensable? Um, so there's, like I said, there's six of those. Questions for application. So number one is, what is at stake in my own life as a Christian in the debate over the historicity of the gospel accounts of Jesus? Um, so there's three here. Two, how does my own faith help me to read the Bible and understand Jesus? Three, how does my membership in the church 
assist my understanding of the gospel accounts of Jesus. And then the terms. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I would have liked the terms first, or at least maybe between the summary and the introduction, because I probably need to look up those terms before I'm going to read it. Um, they would probably be more helpful then. I don't know that the terms are helpful after you're already trying to apply it. So that's odd. Um, so I'm going to tell you, if you're using it, you may want to flip and find those terms first. The introduction is just one page summary. And look, look how short this is. That's a super short one. The others are probably longer. The baptism of Jesus. The summary again is one page, which is nice. The outline takes two and a half pages. Wait. No, the outline is just over one side of one page. That whole rest of the thing was just two and a half pages. Again, the terms tell you where they occur in the text, but um, it's kind of surprising they aren't listed as to what page they would be on the glossary. So let me look up Augustus. Is it back here in the glossary? Yeah. Ah, oh, that's odd. They should have given you the page number where it is and then where you can find it in the glossary. That'd be super helpful. Just saying, Ignatius, if you're going to make another edition, that would be super helpful. Um, the Sermon on Mount, and it tells you right here, the Sermon on the Mount marks out Jesus as the new Moses, as Moses was the teacher of Israel. So Jesus is the teacher of a renewed Israel. That is not obvious as you start the chapter. As you finish the chapter, it is. So it's nice that they're explicit with that right here now. This is a longer one. Oh my goodness. There are 16 questions for group discussion and then six for application. I can tell you if you've ever worked in a small group, there was no way we were ever getting through 16 discussion questions. Never. <laughs> So that's a little surprising, um, but it tells you how important that is. Yeah, the next one in the Lord's Prayer only has 12 questions. Wow, but eight for application. Goodness. And really the notes are just any space left at the end of the chapter. Wow. That's really interesting. Okay, friends. Well, I hope you enjoyed the sneak peek into this duo of books. Um, if, as usual, I have these books. These are books I've kept forever. I've had them for years. Um, so if you need anything more inside, you need me to read or give you a reference, something that you're stuck on, let me know. Um, and I'll try to answer your questions almost as soon as you post them. And friends, let's see, did we have that blessing? I thought it was here in Latin, but then I've lost it. Yeah, I have the wrong prayer here in Latin. Oh, it's in my prayer journal. So I had little cards with prayers in Latin. So I grabbed them earlier when I was doing this, thinking that that's where our um, blessing of Brother Leo was. But it's in the journal, my Lexio journal. Oh, my goodness. That's so silly. I grabbed the wrong book. I apologize. Um, but so may God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the good Lord bless us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.